morning. Glad you are here this morning. Glad you've chosen to come and worship this morning. And you know, as we uh, as we come into worship, we need to realize that we're we're here worshiping the only true and living God, because our God is still alive. Many people go on different days and worship different beings, I guess, different things. But we as Christians worship the true and living God because our Redeemer today. Amen? Amen. Let's sing about that this morning. Never run. 
us when we're unlovable, you chase after us when we run away, you correct us when we're wrong, you encourage us when we're down, you tell us, I look to the hills, where does my help come from? help comes from the Lord Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. There's so many in our world who are religious live in fear of their God and are afraid to tremble in His presence and yet we tremble before you because of your great love. because of your perfection. And so Lord, as we just together as a church family this morning come into your presence, we know that there are hurts that are as deep as life itself that some are dealing with. We know there are victories that take us to the highest mountain that others are dealing with. And we thank you that as a family we can come together and we can weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And you give us your compassion in our hearts to care for one another, Father. So, Lord, let let us just uh, today, let us be the church, the church of the living God. And when people in our community hear what happens up here on this corner, they are just amazed at how great and how good of a Father we have. Lord, we praise you. There's nobody else that merits praise from our lips or from our lives. And there are a lot that ask for it, Lord. But you're the only one true God who deserves it. So as we sing, Lord, let us not just be mouthing words, but let us be focused on you, the giver of life, the giver of light, that put these songs in our heart today to sing to you, Father. May you just be glorified and magnified in praise. May you be lifted high in this place, Lord. You tell us that if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And we praise you for that, Lord. Let us lift high and exalt and magnify Jesus today that men and women and boys and girls might be drawn to your irresistible grace. We love you, Lord. We praise you for your goodness to us and pray that you will just help us as we Continue in song and in giving and in your word, Lord, and in the invitation, Lord. May you just magnify and glorify your name. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As Brother Mike was praying, I was listening to him as he communed with the Father about giving praise. How many of you, when you're in your car, in the shower, home alone, sing like you're the greatest singer in the whole wide world? Amen. That's what we need to do right here. We need to worship and praise. Don't worry about who's sitting in front of you, behind you, beside you. And don't worry about if they think you can sing or not. It's not anything about that. It's we're in the presence of a holy God. Brother Jesse last week reminded us that when we come in here, we're, we're in a sanctuary with an awesome God. And that reverence and that, 
that Holy Spirit's right here with us. And we need to worship Him as if it's just you and the Father right now. And so let's let's give Him the praise and glory that only He deserves. He is the great I Am. That's what this song talks about. The mountains shake, the demons run and flee. And yet He's right here with us. And we get to be right by His side. So just for the next few moments, let it be just you and the Father. And just worship and praise Him the way He deserves. Amen? I want to be close, close to your side. So heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above. Singing as one, hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty, the great I am, who is worthy, there's none beside me, God Almighty, the great
Thank you that we're able to come this morning, and Lord, that we do just get to sing praises to your name, God. And I pray that the sound of our voices is pleasing to your ear, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for this time of our, our service when we come to honor you by uh, bringing back to you a portion of what you've given to us, Lord. And we just pray that it's going to be used to glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank mm-hmm. you. Amen. 
Good to be with you today. A couple of weeks ago, we started a series talking about the person of Jesus, and I just want to say we appreciate the time to be away. Last Sunday morning, about this time, we were headed up the mountain to Pikes Peak. We got up there, it was cold, and it was sleeting even. And then we came off the mountain, and we got down to Pueblo, and it's 107. And it's been that way ever since, so I'm ready to go back. But before we left, we began the study of Christology. Remember that Christology is the study of Christ. It's like biology is the study of life, cardiology is the study of the heart. Christology is the study of Christ. And as we looked at that, we, we dove into this, this lesson about Christ uh, kind of building a, a theology from behind. We were looking at Jesus through the lens of the Old Testament. We saw that scarlet thread that runs through the complete Old Testament, beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when it says, God said, let us make men in our image and our likeness. And that's referring to the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That they are all the way there. And it extends all the way through the last chapter of Revelation with Jesus reigning over his kingdom with love and justice. And so we took this Jesus from behind look a few weeks ago, and today... I want us to take a Jesus from above look. Say that with me, Jesus from above. And you never thought you could do that, did you? Look at Jesus from above because he's higher than the highest. Amen? And we're going to look at him through the lens of the New Testament believers and the New Testament authors. And, and when I say we're taking a look at Jesus from above, primarily we're, we're looking at Jesus as these New Testament believers looked at him in his relationship to where he came from and in his relationship, his unique relationship with God the Father. In order to accomplish this, we're going to look at four passages in our New Testament, four passages, and I want you to know that, that our Bible sees neither difference nor distinction in the Jesus who actually lived, the one who's recorded for us in the Gospels, the Lord Jesus of the New Testament letters, and the Jesus of the Christological creeds, or those creeds that the early church wrote about him, meaning that the Jesus of history and the Jesus of faith are one and the same. They are not two different people. And obviously the New Testament gives us a full and meaningful witness to the person of Christ, but there are certain core beliefs that are the foundational truths that we build theology on when it comes to our understanding of the person of Jesus. Our Old Testament promised that he would come, the New Testament records the fulfilling of those great and wonderful promises. I want to remind you of this, that the New Testament, let me back up, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. They both tell one and the same story, the story of God's love and His redeeming grace to us through the person of Jesus Christ. So, uh, we're going to dive in. Uh, I told you there are four passages we're going to look at. Uh, I actually was working on this a couple of weeks ago, and, and I sent the outline to our son Travis, who's preached here before, and you all have seen him grow up, and he's a pastor, and he's a lot better looking, a lot smarter, and a better preacher than I am. So if you have any questions, then ask his mother. She'll tell you. She'll confirm that for you. But I sent him a, a, a screenshot of my, of my computer screen of the outline and it looked like this the God of creation in Colossians 1 the God of incarnation in John chapter 1 the God of humiliation in Philippians chapter 2 the God of communication Hebrews 1 and he he didn't text me back which is unusual for him he called me and he said dad is that one sermon or four I said good point son I don't think I can get it all in so today we're going to cover the God of creation and the God of incarnation. So let's begin. We're going to begin here in just a moment in Colossians chapter 1. I want you to go ahead and turn there. We're not going to read the passage just yet, but I want to point out one word for you in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. Our passage starts with an important word. It says he, notice that's capitalized in your text, I trust, referring to Jesus. Colossians 1 verse 15 it says he is the image of the invisible God. That word image we need to talk about before we read the entire text. That word image is the Greek word icon. Say the word icon with me. 
Now, in Greek, when you transliterate that to English, it has an E in front of it, so it's E-I-K-O-N, not I-C-O-N like we spell it. But it has kind of the same meaning. That word icon, it depends on the, the context as to what it means. It, it can mean a likeness, a representation, an image, a form, a manifestation, a reflection. It's a relative term, and it depends on, it's determined which meaning it is is determined by the context of the words and the usage that it's used in. Like if I say to you, that's a big truck, you, you might think, well, if, if we've been talking about children's toys, you might think that's a big truck, and you, you think about a big truck, right? Or if I've been talking about, uh, uh, what do they call that thing over there in St. Joe, rednecks with paychecks, if we've been talking about rednecks, y'all know about that? Don't go. But if I've been talking about rednecks with paychecks and I said that was a big truck, you're going to think about a, a truck with an 8-inch lift kit and, and, and big oversized tires and mud tires, and you're going to think about that. But if we've been talking about tractor trailers and construction equipment, I said that's a big truck, you might think about something like this. Can you see those people in front of that tire? It's kind of a, not a, the best picture, but there's a couple standing in front of that tire, and they go up to about where the hub is on that tire. And so that tire is probably about... 11 feet tall. That's a big truck, amen? So you see, context matters. And the context of what we're about to read when it says he is the image, I want to be sure we understand, it, it is saying that Jesus is the perfect, visible manifestation of the invisible God. It's not saying that Jesus came to represent God as his representative. It's not saying that, 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 that Jesus is only a reflection of God, something that would make us think about God himself. It's saying Christ is the icon of the image of the, the, the invisible God, and that is that the nature and the being of God is perfectly revealed in him. You see, Adam was created in the image of God, but Jesus is the image of God. <laughs> the point is clear. Jesus didn't come to represent or remind us of God the Father. He is God himself. So let's stand and read together. Colossians 1, beginning in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so he may come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Once you were, now pay careful attention to this if you're saved because this is telling you what you used to be like and he's going to tell you what you are like now. Once you were alienated once you were alienated okay, a few of y'all getting it. Once you were hostile in mind once you had evil actions but now, oh, but now, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death. Here's what God says about you. You were holy, you were faultless, and you were blameless. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the truth or not shift away from the hope of the gospel that you heard, this gospel has been proclaimed all in, in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. Father, thank you that Christ is Lord over creation. Amen. You may be seated. So as God, Jesus is Lord over a few things. First of all, he is Lord over creation. We see this in verse 15 and 16. It teaches us that there never was a time when Jesus has not been. Let that soak into your mind for a moment. There's never been a time when Jesus has not been. He 
was from the beginning. It's beyond the scope of what my finite mind can understand, but it's true. And Paul gives us three things to note in verse 16 about Jesus' relationship to his own creation. In verse 16, he tells us everything was created by him. That means in his mind, under the sphere of his influence. In essence, it means that creation came about by Jesus. He brought forth the idea of creation. Theologically, there's a distinction between God the Father and His role in creation and God the Son and His role in creation. God is the architect, the master designer, but Jesus is the one who brings it into being. And then through Him, it's not only created by Him, it's created through Him, meaning that creation came about by His power and His authority. He is Jesus, the effective agent of creation. And then for Him, it very simply means unto Him. That means that the goal of Jesus' creation is to praise and worship Him. And the scope of His creation is limitless. Look at what Paul says. It extends how far? From heaven to earth, from visible to invisible, from thrones to dominions, from rulers to authorities. The point Paul here is making is that as the creator of everything, that Jesus is not just some created being. He is the one who spoke it all into existence. <coughs> Have you ever thought about all the wonderful things that Jesus made to reflect His glory and that He gave to us as a gift from Him of His creation? Would you just close your eyes for a moment and, and just think about these things? Think about the softness of freshly watered and freshly mown Bermuda grass on your bare feet. The cool breeze in October blowing across your shoulders. The fragrance of flowers. Think about those patches of blue bonnets alongside the highways as you drive. Or the smell of biscuits in the oven and coffee in the pot first thing in the morning. How about the taste of bluebell homemade vanilla? You can open your eyes now. Leave the grocery store. I know y'all are all in the freezer section right now. God made all of that for our enjoyment. as a gift to us because He is Lord of free. And don't miss what verse 21 says. Look at, look, not, not verse 21, I'm sorry, verse 17. Verse 17 says, By Him all things hold together. You know what that means? That means if Jesus ever did this, we're in heap big trouble. He's holding it all together for us. So the application is simple. We know and serve the God of creation. Jesus Christ is the one who created me. So who better to go to with my problems? Who better to speak to about my health needs? Who better to diagnose my emotional stress? Who is more able to teach me how to live than Jesus, my Creator? He is Lord of His creation. He's Lord of His church. Look at verse 18, 19, and 20. A church without Jesus can look like a church. A church without Jesus can feel like a church. A church without Jesus can have programs and hold services and take offerings, but it's not a church because Jesus did and can exist before the church, but the church cannot exist without Jesus. That's called a cult. And the words Paul chose to use here in verse 18 are significant. It says he is the head, he is the beginning, he is the firstborn, he is the first place. Those all point to the position and the priority of Jesus Christ in his church. It means that this church, First Baptist Church of Whitesboro, belongs to Jesus. He is its head, it is his church, it is not my church, it is not your church, it is not our church. The church doesn't belong to the deacons or the senior adults or the young adults or the children. No, it, it belongs to Jesus Christ. And that means that he takes direction for the he takes responsibility for its direction. He takes responsibility for the care of the body. It means that he is responsible for us meeting the budget or not. It means that he sets the course of ministry. He directs the programming and the mission of the church. Can you imagine going to work tomorrow and telling your boss, "Hey, I know you've got your idea what I'm going to do today, but let me tell you, here's what I'm going to do." I've been doing it your way all this time. Now I'm going to do what I want to do. Can you imagine what would happen? I can tell you what would happen. You better get your resume ready. Because you're going to be hunting. And imagine 
If we go to Jesus and say, okay, Lord, we know it's your church, but here's what we're going to do. That is not the way it works, folks. He is the head. He's the beginning, the firstborn, first place. All of God's fullness dwells in Him. That means that every day, every decision we make, every committee we form, every mission team we send out, we need to check in with our leader before we do any of that. Before we plan a vacation Bible school or a youth camp or a mission trip, we need to know what our master has planned for us. Even get this before we vote on remodeling a building. We ought to know what Jesus thinks about that. Amen? So he is Lord of his creation. He is Lord of his church. And he's Lord of his chosen. Look at verse 21 through 23. Those two phrases, once you were, but now shows us this dynamic contrast of who we were and who we are now. <clears throat> and those words beg this question. Am I in relationship with Jesus? Am I in relationship with Jesus? And, and, and actually, everybody can answer that question. Yes, go ahead and say it. Yes. <clears throat> You're either in a good relationship with him or you're in a negative relationship with him. He says you're either for me or you're against me. They're sheep and they're goats. He draws a clear line in many different ways with many different words. So the most critical question that you can ask yourself today is what type of relationship Am I in with Jesus? See, when Jesus looks at a person, he doesn't see red or yellow, black or white. He doesn't see wealthy or poverty. He doesn't see our educational status or our ignorance. When Jesus looks at a person, he sees one of two things, lost or saved. Those are the only two things he sees, lost or saved. And so if you're saved, you might want to consider just bowing your head right now and say, oh, Jesus, thank you that once I was, but now I am. And if you're not, you ought to be praying, oh, Lord Jesus, I give my life to you. I give my sin to you. I ask you right now, come into my life and cleanse me and forgive me and make me have a rightful relationship with you. So he's the God of creation, the God of the chosen. He's the God of the church. And then we need to back up to John chapter 1 as we look at the God of incarnation. <clears throat> it, it would be a surprise to some of you to hear this, but as much as people in our day have trouble accepting the fact that Jesus was and is God. People in the New Testament had trouble accepting the fact that Jesus was human. That they struggled with that, that, that he could be God and human at the same time. And John addresses this for them and for us in John chapter 1, specifically in verse 14, it says the Word became flesh and took up his residence among us. And the clear message of our Bibles is not that Jesus is just a good man. He's, he's much more than a great teacher. He's much more than a faith healer. He, he is God. And this truth is made exceedingly clear in the passage before us. And the first verse of John chapter 1 clarifies for us three truths that are vital to our understanding of the person of Christ. I, I want to give you a moment. I have confidence you can read verse 1 and just tell your neighbor, what are those three things I can know about Jesus just from this one verse? Go ahead and read it. Now tell your neighbor three truths you can know from this one verse. Boy, y'all are so talkative this morning. Oh, gosh. Leave the theology to the preachers. 
don't have enough service to see what Google says about it. You know what it says. It says he's always been, amen? He is pre-existent. It says he's a distinct person in the Godhead. That indicates both equality with and distinction of his identity from God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And we know that he is God. And he's given here by the Holy Spirit through John the Apostle this title of the Word. That, that's the translation of the Greek word logos, L-O-G-O-S. And if you don't think words are important, you ought to think again. If you don't think words are important, just scold a three-year-old and send him to his room and see what your words mean. Tell an adult some comment about their intellect or their appearance and see what words mean. Words can build up, words can tear down. Words can elevate, words can bring us low. Words, the mean of communication, or the mean of communication, and when God decided to communicate His love, He used words, and His word was the Logos, it was Jesus Christ Himself. You think about what the Word of God has accomplished. Think about what Psalm 33, 6 says. It says, the heavens were made, how? By the Word of the Lord. Just by His breath. All the stars came to be. But also, as a means of communicating the truth of God, desired for His people to hear and follow, the word of the Lord came through His prophets. He even spoke through a donkey one time. And we do well when we think about God speaking through Jesus as the Logos. And what did He say? He says, creation and salvation come from the word of God. Listen to Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God simply spoke, and all we know came to power by His spoken word. Psalm 107, verse 20 says, He sent His word and healed them. He rescued them from the pit. Just by His word, God was able to save a whole people. And none of the words spoken more highly or more plainly or more powerfully than the word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Think with me that through Jesus we see the nature and character of God. Through Jesus, we have the mind of God revealed to us. We have the will of God revealed to us. We see put on perfect display God's perfection. We see God's heart put on display. And if the phrasing of John chapter 1 sounds familiar, it should because it mimics Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But we also find those Words echoed in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. What was in the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. You see, Genesis 1-1 tells the beginning of creation. 1 John 1-1 tells of God being manifest in the person of Christ. And John chapter 1, verse 1 ties Jesus with eternity past. He has always been. So if we were able to hit the rewind button to the beginning, we would find Jesus because He has always been. And it's more than our minds can truly comprehend, but our understanding of who Jesus really is hinges on His preexistence. And we're made explicitly aware that Jesus was there at creation in verse 3. Look at John chapter 1, verse 3 with me. All things were created through Him. Apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. Think about that phrase. Apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. John could have phrased that a different way. He could have said everything was created by Him. I, I think about what John's trying to say here in this way. I think about going over to Fort Worth, to, to the zoo or the arboretum. Or arboretum, I guess is how you say it. The arboretum. And you can get in a helicopter and fly over the zoo and, and you can see the whole thing at once. You can fly over the arboretum and, and see everything at once. But I think what John wants us to do is kind of walk through creation with Jesus. See those zinnias over there? Jesus made those. How about that rose of Sharon? Have you considered that Jesus made it? 
Look at that red yucca. Isn't it beautiful? Jesus made that. How about that old long-necked giraffe over there? How about him? Jesus made him. That rhinoceros, yeah. Goofy as he looks, Jesus made him. Yeah, he wants us to focus on the detail of what Jesus as God, the pre-existence God, did. You see, not only is he the agent of creation, he shares his nature and his being with God. It says the word was God in verse 1. And you think about, do words really matter? If you were to pick up a copy of the New World Translation, that's the one that the Jehovah's Witness use. You turn to John chapter 1, verse 1, it would say this, the Word was a God. Instead of the Word was God. Words matter. Because they put Him as one of many. The true Word of God puts Him as the God. The one and only. So, so what's our application from all this? A couple of things. If someone were to ask John the Apostle, if Jesus, this, this carpenter son from Nazareth, if he really is God, what difference would that make in my life? John answers that question in two ways. The first thing he says is he is life. You know that without Jesus, we're dead in our sins. That's the teaching of the New Testament. You know that, I hope. Without Him, we're dead. We're dead in our sins. What does it mean when we use the word death? It means fundamentally to be separated. Now, I don't want to take you to a bad place, but if you think about our, and I say our, I'm thinking about America's funeral experience, it shows the truth that death equals separation. You walk into a family night over at Matters and people are gathered there, families grieving there, friends are consoling there. But the separation is obvious. And when you have the service, at the end of the service, if they have a pass by, you walk to the casket and you see the shell, just the earthly tent that carried that person's spirit, their soul, through this life. But you know that they are not there. They have been separated. And so as much as physical death separates the soul from the body, spiritual death separates the soul from God. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because John says that in Jesus there is life. Look at verse 4. Life was in him. Life was in him. Have you ever thought about what it is exactly that makes a Christian Hear me out. A Christian is a person who was dead in their sins, but now they've been made alive in Christ. A Christian is a person who was cut off from God, but now has been reconciled to God. A Christian is a person who was a spiritual corpse, but now they've been made alive by Jesus' life flowing through them. A Christian is a person who was dead to God, but has been made alive in Jesus Christ. Life was in him. And then the second thing John says is, and that life was the light of men. So he is life and he is life. Tell your neighbor, what's the purpose of light? How can we have light? What does light do? How many people said it helps me see? How many people said something like, I use the big word, like it illuminates? How many people said the chief purpose of light is to get rid of the darkness? Oh, now we're on to some theological truth here. Yeah, that's what light does. You flip a light switch on in a room, and unless my friend Burl White wired it, <laughs> probably that electricity's going to flow through that circuit interrupter called a switch. It's going to go through those wires, a hot and a neutral, it's going to get to a bulb, and it's going to energize it. That all happens in just a few hundredths of a second. And what happens to the darkness? just leaves. Did you know you once were in darkness? And when Jesus came and gave you life, he also gave you light. And so here's the caveat. His light shines on me 
so that his light can shine through me. No, Christians are funny. They like to have flashlight parties. Y'all ever been to a flashlight party? And you know what you do at a flashlight party? You turn off the lights and you shine the light on each other. And that's what Christians like to do. We like to get together in our in our in our, our blessed bowling alleys and eat sanctified sauerkraut together. Because we're all the same kind of people. Well, Jesus shined his light on us so we can go find people who are still in the darkness and rescue them from the darkness. His light shines in me so that his light can shine through me. This is who Jesus is today. He is life. He is light. He is the God of creation. He is the God of incarnation. He is God. Let his light consume you today you might shine it on somebody in darkness. Would you stand and pray with me? Oh, Father, help us today as we have listened to your word and your truth. And as your life comes to us and your light shines in us, help us be good reflectors, Lord, to send your light out. We pray it. In Jesus' name. If you're here today, you've never received the life that Jesus offers or the light that he can give us. I'd love to share with you about that. If you have another decision to make, I'd love to help you with that as well. As we sing, would you come? Just as I seated i've got a baptism to go get ready for and uh while we're back there getting ready for that donnie odell's going to come he's one of our deacon officers and he's going to lead us in the business meeting as we vote and he's got a list of all the things you're voting on so Good morning. Uh, we are here to conduct a uh, a vote on proposed. Uh,
We might want to add to that boat some new curtains. <laughs> a new opener. Can everybody see okay? This is Naomi Askew, and Naomi came to visit me a few weeks ago in my office, and she prayed to receive Christ as her Savior and wanted to make sure she got that right. And uh, all the children who come see me and talk about salvation and baptism, I give them a little uh, seashell that I picked up off the shores of the Sea of Galilee years ago when I was there. And she went home and put it on a necklace, and she's getting baptized with her seashell from Galilee. So I thought that was pretty neat. So, Naomi, today, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God's only Son? Yes. Do you believe that He was crucified for your sins, that He was buried, and He rose again the third day? Yes. And if you ask Him into your heart to be your Savior and Lord, that upon your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus and in obedience to His command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're buried in likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. All right. Let's stand and join hands across the aisle. Jackie's got an announcement. I do have one announcement. This coming Friday, August 11th, how many of you all were here when Master's Voice was here uh, in our church several months ago? They are going to be at First Baptist Church Sherman Friday night in concert at 7 o'clock. I'm going to take two uh, buses that will hold 30 people, and we're going to leave about 4.30 from behind the church office to go eat at Tracks in Sherman and go on to the concert. If you would like to go to that, call the church office and sign up. And uh, any of you all can go, but I'm going to take the 55-plus guys and gals that if you want to go and need a ride, I'm gonna, I have two buses reserved, and so just call and let us know if you're going to be going with us. It is a free concert, and there will be a love offering taken for Master's Voice. Also, it's, it seems like a long way away, but the third week end-ish in um, October, Master's Voice will be here at our church again doing a revival. So you need to begin praying right now for revival to begin within your heart. And we'll have revival meetings with Master's Voice leading all that revival uh, for uh, Sunday through Wednesday. So you'll get more information on that coming up. But this Friday, we'll be leaving at 4.30, and April has something also. Michael told me to remind him. Well, how can I remind him when he's up there? <laughs> but yesterday, um, we had one of our... Uh, young adults now used to be he went through our um, has been our church all his life at Scout Sanders graduated from Stephen F. Austin yesterday with a business degree and we're excited for him congratulations Scout we're proud of you all right let's you already join hands across the aisle John Sanders why don't you dismiss us in prayer Redeemer 